connections. So, in fact, let me make one, one little step back. When, uh, so now we know, we have seen what it means to have an affine connection. And actually, I didn't show you by examples. I mean, it's, it's a bit delicate, but you have to believe me, or you can try to do it as an exercise. That on a differentiable manifold, there are infinitely many. In fact, it's, they form an infinite dimensional space, the space of affine connections. Okay, so we add the condition of compatibility with the Riemannian method. So suppose that your differentiable manifold is actually Riemannian, so it's more than differential. Maybe we can close the door. And uh, and we are trying to see whether there is a canonical one. Okay, so that's our problem at the moment. Actually, before passing to the Riemannian metric, let's uh, let's see the uh, the, the trick. The, the way we are doing it is to mimic to take properties of the standard differentiations in R n and to put them as definitions. Okay, so as kind of the axioms of the definition of what we are doing. So we have put the Leibniz rule, the linearity, and so on in the definition of the affine connection. We have seen the compatibility in one way. Now we will revisit it in a moment. But before doing that, there is actually still something which does not depend on the fact that there is a metric which can help us in identifying a unique one, which is the following. If you take two vector fields, and you look at, at this, okay? So <coughs> you switch the direction of the, the, of the differentiation with the object that you are differentiating, okay? So what does it happen in our end? Well, maybe that's not, that's not completely obvious, but it is obvious with the standard differentiation in our end. If x and y are the standard vector fields, so if this is the, the partial derivative with respect to one direction, and y is the partial derivative with another direction, then can you do you see what's what's the result of this in the standard case? Zero. Zero. Okay. So if you take in R n the partial this these two, the, the difference between these two derivatives is zero. Now actually <laughs> the reason why this is true is that on Rn, what you would put, if this is not true, if these are general vector fields, in Rn, what you would get is this. Okay? So, remember, this is xy minus yx acting on functions. Okay? So it's kind of a measure of the, yeah, of the non-commutativity of the, of, the, of the derivatives. Okay? So, so again, as, as, we, as, we, as we are doing for everything else, let's take this property and put it as part of the definition. So actually, we say that nabla, so now, it, now this is really becoming a definition. Not every affine connection must satisfy this. Okay? So if, if this is true for any, of course, x and y, I think that we call the space of vector field something like this, then Nabla is called torsion free. Okay. It's a little bit more delicate to justify why. But again, it's another property of our end that we import on any differentiable manifold. Okay. So in fact, the observation about the, 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 the standard vector field, this holds on any Riemannian, on any manifold. Okay, if you pick these two, you get zero everywhere. I mean, the bracket, the Lie bracket of two coordinate vector fields is always zero, not just in array. Okay, so this whole this this is interesting. I mean, when uh, I mean, okay, so. This is an extra property, so we will call, and so something like this we'll call an affine connection, which is also torsion free. Now, so as you can see, there is no metric here. This is not about compatibility with the Riemannian metric. Okay? 
So this belongs to the class of the So now let's put the Riemannian metric into the game. And uh, actually, revisiting a little bit in the notes, I think I was starting going in a direction which would take us too long. We are left with only two lectures. So I gave you a definition of uh, what it means the metric, the affine connection to be compatible with the Riemannian metric, forget it. I'll give you a simpler one. And what you will actually, it, it is correct, what you have in your notes will be an if and only if, but I won't prove it. Okay? So let me replace it with a more, with a simpler definition, which is the following. So now we are on MG. So now we add the scalar product in our game. And then <coughs> NABLA is called compatible if, well, compatible with G, of course, but in general, let's say compatible if for any choice now of three vector fields, x, y, and z, if you take the derivative, so x is, the, is a differentiation, is a vector field. So of the scalar product of the other two, this behaves like in Rn. Okay? So this behaves, but what is the only way? So you would say this is the scalar product of the derivative of the first times the second plus the first times the derivative of the second. But how can you write the, the scalar product between the derivative of the first times the second. Well, when you put the derivative inside, you're actually using the connection. Okay? So that's the derivative. So this, this has to be, I mean, the only way this makes sense, I mean, there is no, no need to make any effort in remembering, because it's the only possible way to differentiate when you go inside, plus Okay? So this is the the simplest way to say that something is compatible. <coughs> now, so if, if NABLA is both compatible, of course, NAB, if I put the symbol NABLA, it really means it's an affine connection by default. So 1, 2, and 3, the properties 1, 2, and 3 will be there for sure. So if on top, if NABLA is both compatible and torsion free, then actually we can essentially write it down almost. So how much? Of course, we have the following equation. So I'm trying to get some kind of formula for this. So I would like to write nabla x y equal to something. Okay? So now in this game, instead of telling you how much is nabla x y, I'm going to tell you how much is the scalar product of nabla x y with, with uh, any vector field z. Okay? So of course, the two data are the same. So I know a vector if and only if I know its scalar product with respect to anything else. Okay? So, can I say how much is this? Well, let's manipulate it a little bit. Of course, I can go back here. I isolate it from here. So this becomes x of g, y, z minus g of y nabla x, z. <coughs> And now I use the torsion fee property. What is it? Here. Okay, so I take it. I can replace nabla xy with this express with the, the sum of the other two. So but this is also equal to what? This, this becomes equal to g of xy z plus g of nabla yx. So I can change them z. And then I can play the game again. I can take out this derivative with respect to y. So this becomes equal to g of x, y, z 
C, <coughs> then plus y of g x z minus g of x nabla y z. Okay, so now I can, uh, I have an equality, I can add and I can replace x, y, and z in all possible combinations. So this implies immediately the following formula. That twice, actually I take the sum, I can tell you, I mean, well, write, write twice g of nabla x, y, z equal to, so write two lines and then you take the sum of the right hand sides of both. And what you get is that twice g of nabla x, y, z is equal to what? Kind of a long expression. Uh, also, you need to permute the, the vector fields. But this is x of g, y, z plus y of g, z, x, or x, z, because g is symmetric, of course, minus z of g, x, y and up to here I'm fine, plus, and then I start adding, plus g of z x y plus g of y. Remember, the, 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 the bracket is anti-commutative, so you have to be careful about the order, okay? So that's why um, uh, z x minus g of x Wise. Okay, I'm not hiding anything strange, I, re I repeat, I mean I just uh, take these two equations and I apply them for any possible combination of x, y and z and I take the sum, actually I take, so I have three of these because I can take x, y, z and I switch z, x, y, then I switch and I get uh, y, z, x, okay, no three, I have this, these equations, I take the sum of two minus the third one, and I get this one. And the, here, of course, I am using the Jacobi identity and so on. Okay, so, why should, I, why, why, why should I like anything like this? Because this is answering the question I was looking for. This is telling me g, x, y, the ve I mean, now I know, I have a formula which is giving me this vector here, I mean, not, not exactly this vector, but the scalar product of this vector with anything else, which is the same thing also as knowing this vector, okay? So, actually, this is usually called the Kossuth form. Okay? But the fact that I found this formula is again, I mean, the fact, it's again, not really the formula itself. The fact that the formula exists is telling me what? That if nabla is compatible and torsion-free, then it's basically unique. It, it has to be this one. Okay? So, this is a very good indication that we are on the right track. So, in fact, uh, Okay, so such a nabla is uniquely defined and is called the Levitschivita connection. Okay. Modulo, <coughs> actually, it would be slightly premature to give this name. I mean, I give this name, but actually there is something to check. Well, no, not really. I mean, in this form, it's okay. So, what this is proving is that on a Riemannian manifold, basically, there is a unique... <coughs> a fine connection, which is compatible with the metric, and torsion-free, okay? 
So it's canonical. Okay. Now, of course, in fact, this is sometimes even called the fundamental theorem in Riemannian geometry, because this is saying there is one way you really need to have a very special reason not to use it, not to use this one. Okay? So, of course, if you play the game in Rn, in Rn you take the Euclidean metric, the Riemannian metric, which is constant, does not depend on the point. I mean, we will see it, actually. Uh, we will do it as an exercise. Of course, this has to be the one that you, we have always used. Okay? That's why we didn't even notice there was a problem. Okay? This answers the, the same question on any, on any Riemannian metric. So, <coughs> okay, so I think I started hinting uh, uh, this in general for affine connections. Let's do it now for this uh, special one. So, in a chart, so how does such a thing look in a coordinate chart? So, of course, I work around the point, and now I take the vectors, the standard vector, the standard tangent vector fields, which are given by xi, given by ddxi, okay? If I apply this game, so suppose I have m is of dimension n, okay? So, this means i goes from 1 to n, I have n of these vectors. And then I can look at the action of the affine of the Levi Civita connection on this vector. So I can take I can take this. Okay. They form a basis. So remember what we argued last time is that if we know this, we know the whole connection. I mean if you give me a general x and y, I can write down something, a formula which decomposes nabla xy into a combination of this. Okay, so if I know this of these vectors, I know the whole connection. But this is, what, what do I know about this? Nothing, except it's another vector. So if being another vector, it has be, to be a linear combination of these. So I give names, this we already done, okay? We, I give names to these, so it has to be some kind of linear combination. Of course, the coefficients are functions, okay? Point by point, it's linear of the standard vector. Okay, so let's see what we can say about this. Remember, these are called the Christoffel symbols. You can do this for any connection, for any affine connections, okay? But now, in this, uh, in this particular case, you can actually put it here and derive the expression of the Christoffel symbols. So, now if you pick, how do I find gamma, I mean, I don't want to do the whole computation, but I want to tell you how to do it, because then it's three lines. So, how do I find gamma k i j? Well, it's the, it's the component of this vector along this vector here. So, one way to find it is, of course, taking the scalar product between this and the dxk. But I have to be careful that these vectors are not, I mean, this would work, this would be exactly gamma, if they were of norm 1. I mean, if you give me two vectors, otherwise, okay, so basically what I'm just saying is that you, I take x to be equal xi, y is equal to xj and z is equal to xk. Okay, I plug them in that formula and what do I get? Let's write down at least what I get on the left. I get twice the scalar product of nabla xi xj. In fact, I should call it now gamma l be careful. I mean, that's, uh, that's why I'm doing it. I mean, physicists are much more quick than us 
in doing this kind of computation with indices, okay? I cannot call this index k if I'm going to call k the other one, okay? So this is one linear combination. i and j are okay. These are really i and j because I'm taking xi and xj. And then I write it as dxl. That's one. And then I'm taking the scalar product with dxk. Okay? Now, on, on, the, on the right hand side, I, I just go and write what it is all turn by turn. Okay? I will analyze it for a moment. But let's, let's first see what is this? I mean, is this. These are not, as I said, these are not orthonormal. This is just a basis induced by the coordinates. Okay? So, this is actually what? Of course, G is a bilinear thing operator. So gamma goes out, so this is twice gamma L I J, and now I'm left with the scalar product between XL and XK, but this is not. So I have a question. We have Z to be forced to XK. Yes. How come is changed to the XK? Sorry? How come is changed to the XK from the formal argument? XK is by definition okay. the XK. So, okay? So here, well, let me write everything just for, so this, I should, really what I'm left here is this. Okay? And now this is not delta LK. I mean, don't, don't be cheated by the Euclidean. This is the Riemannian scalar product of these two vectors, which, we, I mean, we don't know, and so we have to leave it. This is what we have called GLK. Okay, it's the LK entry of the matrix representation of the Riemannian metric. Okay, so this you have on one side. What do you get on the right hand side of this of the Kosu formula? Well, this is what this is going to be DDXI of G JK. This is a function, no? This is the, the JK fun element of the matrix G. Then I get uh, D, D, X, J of G, I, K. Here, G is symmetric, so I don't care in which order. Minus uh, D, D, X, K of G, I, J. And up to here, it's okay. What does it happen when I start having the brackets? That I'm lucky. Well, or I worked well. Because now these are coordinate vectors. And what is the bracket of two coordinate vectors? Zero. Okay? So actually all these three terms, which would scare you quite naturally, actually are zero. I mean, in general, I don't have any formula for expressing the bracket of two vector fields in terms of the earth. Okay? But here I'm, I'm restricting to the coordinate vector fields, and so it's zero. So, in fact, we can do it. I mean, let's write it. I'm doing an exercise. So this would be, what do we say? Dxi of G, uh, Jk uh, plus Dxj of G, Ik minus Dk, Dxk, G, Ij. Okay? So this is what I get on the right-hand side. But my mystery object was this. So, is this formula telling me how much is gamma L J K? <laughs> yes, but how? Think of this as a linear system. This is a linear system where these are the unknowns and these are the coefficients of the unknowns. So how can I kill the coefficients? I multiply by the inverse matrix of this. Okay, and then I'm done. But then the actual formula becomes what? Becomes that gamma L J K is one half, okay, one half, of the inverse matrix of G. You see, I take this G here and I have to put it on the on the other side by taking the inverse times this expression. Okay. In any case, that's it. This is the answer. So, the, of course, if there was a unique one, I need 
I, I had to have a formula. And this is the formula for the affine connection, actually, so the, for the Christoffel symbols, which is the same, which contains the same amount of information as knowing the whole thing, in terms of what? In terms of the coefficients of the metric. Okay? So if you give me G, I can actually, at least locally, I can write down the Levi Civita connection. That's the moral. Doesn't matter. It's not beautiful. It's not a particularly useful formula, but it's, use, it's useful in the sense of understanding on what does it depend on. Okay, so for example, it's clear that it depends on the first derivatives of the components of the metric. Okay, for example. That's, that's the kind of thing, I mean, you, it, we use it, but not too often, okay? <coughs> okay, so let me go quickly then, okay, we can come back to what is the... questions up to now because this is a, a, a this is a turning point in uh, in the theory okay so as I told you last time the notion of an affine connection actually gives rise automatically to a notion of parallelism of parallel vector fields okay so of course it will be particularly important to understand in the case of the Levi Civita connection I mean, now the Levi Civita connection really stands out among all possible connections as a very special and most important one. So, let's analyze what's going on now for this, uh, for this thing. <coughs> so, we have seen how an affine connection actually restricts to the notion of derivative of vector fields along a curve. Because actually, an affine connection is, of course, more. Because an affine connection tells you how to take the derivative of a vector field which is defined on an open set. So if you have just a curve and the vector field along a curve, of course, you take the restriction and you take the, the, the affine connection restricted to that. Okay. Vice versa, we argued a little bit. If you have only a vector field along a curve, you, in principle, you cannot take the action of the connection on a vector field along a curve. Because, as I said, you need the vector field along an op on an open set, at least. Okay? So you, you first need to extend it to an open set. And this can be done only locally. Okay? Not globally on a curve, but at least locally you can do it, and then you take the affine connection, then you restrict it back to the curve. Okay, so differentiations along curves and differentiations and, uh, and affine connection, I mean, they give the same amount of. Uh, uh, actually, this is something I should have done already last time, so let's do it. If we play this game, so now, again, mg is a Riemannian manifold, and I take a curve gamma from some interval to M. Then, actually, this operation is just described by hand waving. Let's call it, and D in DT is like the, the, res, the action of the affine connection on vector fields along curve. Okay? So, uh, this is the action. of the connection nabla, whether it's Levi Civita or not, we don't care. This is completely general. On vector fields along gamma. Okay.
Morally, what this is saying, I mean, you have to put it in bracket because there are all these extension problems, is that if I take a vector field, for example, y along gamma, this means that the y and the t at a given point, so this is actually the same thing as nabla gamma dot of y at the point gamma of t. Okay? So the, 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 the quotation marks are just modulo these extension problems. Okay? Because if I look on the left hand side, this is a vector along gamma. And if I look on the right hand side, y is a vector defined over the whole thing. Okay? Okay, so let's write down what is the local expression again. So suppose that actually gamma lies into a chart, inside a chart. So how do I write it down? So, <clears throat> if gamma of i is contained in uh, x of u, okay, with the obvious notations, okay. so that means what? That y of t, which actually is no, is no arm, okay, because this will always be true up to choosing the interval sufficiently small. So I can always assume that this is true. So y of t, I can, I can write down y of t as a linear combination of the standard vector fields induced by the coordinates. Okay. So this is going to be the sum over j of some functions xj. This, I'm using here the, 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 the notation as before. xj is d dx j no? okay. at the point gamma of t. Okay. And now how much is dy dt? So how much is the covariant derivative of this vector along the curve? Well, since this is the restriction of the affine connection, every time I see a, a, a linear combination with functions, I know how to do it because it has to be Leibniz, it has to be linear, and so on. Okay? So this becomes what? This is the sum. So first I need to take the derivative of the alpha. Okay? So this becomes alpha dot j. In fact, probably it's better to call it with another index. So this sum over k xk. And this is the trivial part. Okay? And then there is the real action of the affine connection. So this is becomes the sum over j of alpha j of t. And now this is the action d in dt over the xj at the point gamma of t. Okay, so now the, the question is, now I decompose this in turn, this is a vector, so it has to be a linear combination. I put the Christoffel symbols into the game again, so this becomes the sum <coughs> Okay. Mm. Okay, so this becomes the sum over k of alpha dot of t k plus the sum over i and j of alpha j of t because now I'm decomposing this as a linear combination in the dxk in the xk okay so this becomes gamma dot by chain rule gamma dot i of t gamma k i j at the point gamma of t. And all this is, multi, is the coefficient of the vector, how am I calling here, xk. Okay? Just apply the, the, the usual formula that we know of now. Okay? From where does this uh Gamma dot i come from? Because x is a function of gamma of t. Ah, okay. okay, so I need to take chain rule. Okay. I need to use it to use it uh, chain rule. Okay. So this is useful. This uh, uh, notice that I've never used here maybe chili. Nothing. Eh? This is the expression of the of this operator 
with respect to, again, to the basis of uh, induced by a chart. Okay. Okay. So now, but this is useful when, when we actually apply. <coughs> so we say that x, in these notations, I have a, a Riemannian manifold and the curve. We say the vector field x in is parallel if nabla gamma dot of x is equal to zero. Okay. Which is actually the same thing as the T. You see, modulo the, 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 the quotation marks nabla gamma dot is this operator here. Okay, modulo this extension problem. Okay, so now it's parallel in this. And now, even as important, in particular, this rules out a very special class of curves. So this is for any curve. So I pick any curve, and I'm asking, what does it mean for a vector to be parallel? And I'm saying, well, if the derivative is 0, okay, it's constant. I would say it's constant. What I really want you to understand is that this has nothing to do with the fact that the components are constant functions. It's much deeper. Okay? So, this is for any gamma. Okay? This will look something like this. But actually, I can apply it in some sense to itself, to the curve gamma itself. And this rules out a very special class of curves. So, gamma is called geodesic if x equal gamma dot is parallel. So, among all possible vector fields along a curve, of course there is one very special one, the tangent vector, the tangent vector field. So if it happens, this miracle, that the tangent vector is parallel, of course this means, and this is a condition which depends only on gamma, okay? then we call it a geodesic. Okay. So, so you can actually, it, the most elegant way, of course, is to say if nabla gamma dot gamma dot is equal to zero. Okay. Now, so we face the usual problem that we faced for surfaces. Do they exist? when they exist, which, is, which are the degrees of freedom for them to exist, and so on. Good, so let's move in this direction. So, proposition. <coughs> With all these notations that I'm not going to repeat, suppose that we pick a given point T0 in the interval AB Okay, suppose for a moment that I is uh, the interval AB, okay. and we pick one vector, tangent vector V0 in T gamma naught M, gamma of T0 of M. So I fix a, a tangent vector at a given point on my manifold. You see, I still have no curve. Well, yeah, well, I have a curve. Suppose. I have a curve gamma, and I fix a point, and I fix a vector. Okay, I'm not saying that this is tangent to the curve at this point. It's tangent to the manifold. Okay, V or V naught, and this is gamma of T naught. Okay. Then there exists a unique vector field. V, like Y, uh, parallel, and Y of gamma of T naught is equal to V. Okay? So this is kind of a Cauchy problem. You say, I fix starting point with a starting direction. And the answer, this proposition is telling me, is that actually there is a unique extension, a, a unique parallel extension of this vector 
parallel, which gives me this initial value. Okay. Of course, here, well, of course not. Notice, in fact, in fact, I was. Um, do we assume that this curve is contained in a chart? Or? No. Okay. This is a global. In fact, there are two interesting things here. Yeah. Um, this is not a smallness result. I mean, I'm not saying that actually I have to pick this interval very small. If, if you think of the case of geodesic, when you say, ah, oh, given a point and the vector is a unique geodesic, defined over an interval which might be very small. Okay, here, this is, this is different. Okay, this is actually a global extension property of parallel vector. So are we fixing a specific part here, or we are just given the point and the... No, gamma is given. No, no, gamma is given, otherwise... No, gamma, I didn't rewrite. I, M, G, and gamma are part of the data. Okay. So, let's prove it, and now, now to irritate you, I go in a chart. <laughs> okay, and then, and then we will see what does it happen when the curve goes out. Remember, there is this problem. Okay, so let's first take a chart which of course contains the initial point and then the, the, the initial values of this problem. Okay. So actually I don't have to rewrite anything because fortunately I didn't erase the blackboard. Because I wrote here, in a chart. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for y of t. Okay? Which has to be parallel, but parallel means this is not like gamma dot of y. I wrote it here. Fortunately, it's still here. Okay? So if nabla, this is nabla gamma not, nabla gamma, gamma not at t, uh, of, of y, at the point gamma of t naught. Well, in fact, at any point, at gamma of t. Okay. So what does it mean? I, I'm asking it to be parallel, so I'm asking this to be zero. But what did I write here? I write it's the composition into the basis. No? These are the coefficients with respect to the basis xk. So how can this vector be zero? Well, this vector is zero if and only if or for even every time I fix k, this thing here is zero. This is the coefficient with respect to a basis. Okay? So parallel the vector y is parallel if and only if. I have this system of equation, of course, for any k. Okay. So I have n, a system of n equations of this type. But where are the unknowns? Where are the data and where are the unknowns? Gamma is given. Gamma is given. It's a part of the problem. Okay. So the, the connection is given. So this is not, this is a coefficient of the problem. This is not. The unknowns, of course, are the coefficients of y, are the alpha. Okay? So this is a so this how do you how do how, how, how do you think of this system? It's kind of x dot plus lambda x equal to zero. Okay, then you put then, then it becomes a matrix. I mean every line of this matrix looks like x dot plus lambda x equal to zero, where lambda is something you know. Okay. So game over. Okay? Because this is a linear system, the coefficients of the, the of the of the derivatives are invertible. In fact it's the it's the identity. Okay. So it has 
existence of, uh, of solutions and uniqueness of solution. If you give me, it's a first order system. So if you give me the initial value, one initial, I mean, it's a first order system, so you have to, you have to give me alpha k at t, at t0 and alpha dot of k at t0, which is exactly the starting point and the starting vector. Okay? So there is, there is global existence and uniqueness, but global up to the point where I can write the system. So inside the chart. So now I come to your objection. Okay? So this proves <coughs> existence and uniqueness inside the chart. And now what if gamma was not inside the chart, was going out? Exactly as in my picture. My picture is becoming a bit of a mess, but I mean now I'm getting here, and now suddenly I go out. So up to here I have no problem. I can extend this vector up to here. And now, so then of course the only thing I can do is to go into another chart with some overlap. Now you see the solution, no? It's uniqueness now that uh, is playing for us because now. I, I take a point of intersection and I re, re, reproduce this, pro, this proof starting now from this point with the, the value that coming from the left this parallel vector field got. And now this, again, this proposition now applied to the second chart will, be, will tell me how to extend it to the second part of the curve. Okay? And then if there is a third, I go to the third. If there is a fourth, I go to the fourth. And eventually this is a compact I mean, that's why I put the square brackets here. There will be a finite number of them. And I've, this, the, this curve has to be covered by a finite number of charts. Okay, otherwise I might have a problem. Okay. Which problem? <coughs> if it's not covered by a finite number of charts, hmm, which problem do you enter? Well, at the moment, I cannot imagine any curve which is not covered by a finite number of charts. Uh, let's see. Yeah, we can. Um, right. You see, when you get to this point, it's a good exercise for you. <laughs> what, what does, what, what, which pathologies can you imagine when the curve is not covered by a finite number of charts? That's a good question. Okay. Let's leave it for further discussion. Okay. Now, Now let me recover probably the definition I gave you last time of parallelism. So, so at least your notes will become a bit uh, coherent. So again, another proposition. If x and y are parallel along a curve, I think that was actually the definition I gave you, I gave you last time. Then, and actually now, uh, okay, then the function on gamma, g of x, y. So I look at the scalar product between these two vectors, okay, and actually, sorry, yeah, but now I really need nabla, maybe g. Otherwise, this is not true. Okay. See, this, this object, the scalar product between two vectors restricted to the curve gamma, is a function of t. 
So for any point t, I go to the point gamma of t and I compute this. Okay. So this is actually a function from i to r. Okay. As a function of t, then this is constant. Is z agree on a void, right? Sorry? It, what if it's a void to agree in a void? What, the, what doesn't agree? We have two uh, vector fields. Yes. It could be they, they don't agree in any point. But they don't have to agree with anything. These are two vector fields. But they have to be parallel. Okay. They have to be different. Otherwise, yes. I don't want... This is not XX. I mean... No, I mean... Because if they agree on a point using the uniqueness of the, the, of the previous proposition... They are the same. The yes. Yes. I don't want them to be the same. Okay. I mean, this otherwise, yeah. Well, otherwise, it's still interesting. Yeah? I mean, the, that would mean that, in fact, it's a, it's a natural corollary of this. If x equal to y, this is telling me that the norm square of a parallel vector field is constant. But that's a, a, a corollary of this. Yeah? I want them to be free to move. So and how do you prove it? <coughs> well. You just write down what? You just write down the derivative of this. This is a clearly smooth, a differentiable function. Everything is differentiable here. So I take d in dt of g of x, y. Of course, this is a function. Remember, it's computed at the point gamma of t. How many brackets? One missing. OK. But, but, but now I know how to put the derivative inside the scalar product if it's levi Okay, Of course, in general, there is no compatibility between derivative and uh, connection. But if it's levi yes. But what is, actually, this is written not in the usual way, so you have to think a moment. Because if this was a vector field x or z, no, z what we said is that nabla is levi if z of g x y is equal to g of nabla z x y plus uh, g of x nabla z y. So if this was a vector field, I take the definition of levi civit and I know what to do. Now this, this is, doesn't look exactly like a vector field unless you interpret it properly. This is the derivative in time. So which is your proposal? How do I throw it in? Which is the corresponding vector field? Can we take the the, the, the tangent one to the curve with the one we bar bar but can, you, can you justify it? Yes. The right answer is this is actually gamma dot. Why? Why in the sense of with the H, not for this one. Why? Why the right interpret why this actually so let me write the answer. So this is actually g of nabla gamma dot x y plus g of x nabla gamma dot y. I think if you convince yourself that this is true, I think you have, you have understood what is a what is a connection. There's not much to say actually. Either you think it's it's okay or not. But well. This is the usual derivative of a function of one variable. Okay. While here, so try to spell out what is this. I think it's actually still there, fortunately. Well, this is, if you, if you think of what is this, this is actually, again, the derivative of every object restri restricted to the curve gamma and taking the derivative with respect to t on the manifold m. Okay? So that's why the vector, the, the derivative d in dt corresponds to gamma dot. Okay? To the to the act to the <coughs> covariant derivative with respect to gamma dot. Okay? So and now it's done. Because if they are parallel, they are both, these, these objects are both zero. Okay? So as your colleague was saying, in particular, the norm square of uh, the, or the norm, the norm of a parallel vector field is constant. Okay, this.
this actually allows, this is a rather technical thing and we don't have too much time, but it's important, so let me highlight it, to solve one technical problem which is very useful in Riemannian geometry. Because you see, on a chart we have the standard basis of vectors, but of course the standard basis of vectors do not satisfy any Riemannian property whatsoever. I mean, they are nice, the d, dx, k, no? They are nice, but they have nothing to do with the metric g. Okay? So this is a point-by-point -point basis of the tangent vector, which is good. I mean, so we can write every, every tangent vector as a linear combination of these around every point, and we, have kept, we, we kept on doing this, no? Every, every step. On the other hand, the bad, the bad side of this is that they have nothing to do with the metric, so in fact, the scalar product between these vectors are completely without control, and in fact, these are the functions g, k, l. Okay, they are not orthogonal, they are not normal, they are nothing. Okay, so actually the idea of parallelism can help. And again, you have to think to what we did for surfaces. Remember the construction of the geodesic coordinates in some sense? This is where we are aiming now. <coughs> and the idea, I mean, let me just state it as a, as a proposition, because now what you can, but actually it's not even a proposition, it's a picture. I think. You take a point, look at the following construction. You take a point, of course, at this point P, I pick any base, if you pick me, if you give me any basis of the tangent space at this point, at TPM, you can orthonormalize it at one point. Okay? So, TPM, I say it's the span of V1, Vn, where uh, v, v, the, the set, this basis is actually is orthonormal with respect to G. Okay. Now suppose you have a curve passing through this point. A very good idea is to take the, the parallel extension of this basis along this curve. So suppose in my picture, well, in the picture of course makes no sense. Suppose here I have these two orthonormal vectors at this point. Now I apply to each of them, I apply to V1 the extension property. What is it? Here. Okay? So I extend V1 to a parallel vector along gamma. Then I extend V2 to a parallel vector along and then I extend them, then I extend them all. What did I gain? Well, I gained the fact, for example, V1 was of norm 1, and now even the extension is of norm 1 everywhere. V2, V2, they are all of norm 1. These were orthogonal at time 0, and now by this second proposition, they stay orthogonal everywhere. So this is a nice way, geometric way, to construct orthonormal frames for the tangent space along curves, okay, in a nice parallel way. Of course, in this way you can say that the metric component, now if I use this frame, g will become trivial, because this becomes delta ij, in some sense. But the problem is that I cannot even say it, because, it, because these are not the coordinate vectors of some chart. So I gain something and I lose something else. So depending on the situation, I might prefer this or I might prefer the old ones. Okay? You see the problem? I cannot say, even suppose that for in, an incredible amount of luck, at the beginning this was dx1 and this was dxn. When I do the parallel transport, the parallel extension of these vectors, I lose this property. Okay? These are just tangent vectors. I don't know whether they come from a coordinate. Okay? Okay, this is a bit technical, but 
And now, finally, we come to the geodesic. So this, this was kind of the basic properties of the parallelism. Now we are, oh, and that was a very bad idea. Sorry, but to cancel the box. Can't we, can't we change the chart to make our vectors uh, to be bases in the use of using the chart? That's a very subtle question. Can you do it? My answer is no. Try it and see what it happens. Okay. But now let's go to geodesics. And uh, as I said, I mean, look look again at the box which was here. Okay. So what? The problem is, uh, that's really a pity, because now I have to rewrite the system, and I think I really have to do it. Um, but remember, okay, let me write first, I mean, now I'm going to prove everything I want to prove, but remember that the system of parallelism was a, some kind of form alpha dot plus uh, mass with gamma, alpha equal to zero with a k, okay? Now, actually here there was even a gamma dot. Okay. Now, the, so this was the, the condition, these were the coefficients of the vector y to be parallel. Now, the geodesic problem asks us what? It's not any vector that has to be parallel, but it has to be gamma dot, which has to be parallel. So alpha, what is alpha? Which alpha do I have to put in this system in order to get the geodesic equation? Well, in this case, so remember that the idea was, unfortunately, I have essentially to rewrite. So I, I wrote alpha k dx k. Y was this, OK? Or with an i or whatever, OK? Now, the problem is, if y is equal to gamma dot, how do I write alpha? It's gamma dot. Okay, it's gamma dot i. So, meaning it's the i-th component of the vector gamma dot. Okay, but now, if alpha is equal to gamma dot, look at this system here now, what does it, what does it become? So this system, take it from your notes, I'm not, I don't want to copy it again, becomes what? Well, of course, it will become gamma double dot, okay? So this becomes the sum over k, so parallel, so gamma dot parallel becomes the sum over k gamma double dot k plus now here there was a gamma by itself and here there is an alpha which is a sorry a gamma dot here was inside the box and now there is an alpha which is another gamma dot okay so here what happens is that this becomes the sum over i and j from 1 to n of gamma dot i gamma dot j and then the Christopher symbols. Of course, everything here, this is computed at t or gamma of t times xk at gamma of t. Okay? So I just rewrote it. I'm not cheating. I just replaced alpha with gamma dot. And then again, how this is a vector, how can it be zero? Well, it is zero if and only if all the components are zero. And so you re regain, I'm saying regain because actually that this has to be zero for any i. So you, you forget the sum. And this has to be for any k equal to 1n. So now, this is the system. So now I really want, I would like to, to, to 
to state theorems, propositions like this one, no? given a point in the vector there, is a, there exists a unique uh, geodesic starting from this point, I would like to do again what I did for parallelism for geodesics. Now the problem is, can I do it? No, well, not exactly. Not exact, not as powerful, now the theorems are not as powerful as before because this has become a second order, non-linear. So it is still true that if you give me, so given gamma of t naught and the vector v naught in t p in t gamma of t naught m, it is still true that there exists a unique extension, but I completely lose control on the domain. So there is only a small, exi small time existence theorem. Okay, so there exists a unique, well, unique, but un if I put the uniqueness symbol, I get into a little bit of troubles, but gamma, and I can call it gamma v naught, from some interval minus epsilon, epsilon, in M, geodesic, such that gamma v naught at zero is equal to gamma, what I, whatever, but maybe I should give you a P naught, I mean, this, I should, this should be called a starting point, no? P naught, and gamma dot at, of V naught at zero is equal to V naught, but then if I put the uniqueness symbol, of, I have to be careful about this epsilon, so this is unique if I say that epsilon is maximal, otherwise I can pick half of it quarter of it, I mean they would be all different geodesics because they have a different domain, okay, with maximal epsilon, okay. <coughs> okay. And now, okay, it's a nice exercise to go back to the case of surfaces and, dub and double check that you are not discovering anything new. Okay, this is exactly the system that we found for a surface in R3, but here there is a beautiful exercise. This would be nice to do it. We don't have time to kind of connect the two things that we are studying. What is the Levi Civita connection? I mean, after all, here we are using a machinery that was not never mentioned. Okay? Well, now, and this is the, 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 the really the beautiful thing. You have to think of a surface in R3 as a Riemannian manifold. So what is the Riemannian metric? But it's the one induced by R3, it's the first fundamental form. Okay? And you say, well, but then what? I should compute the Levi-Civita connection of this. Yes, in principle, yes, you can do it. But you have the formula for gamma. Remember the formula we found? Now XA, XI, XJ are just uh, XU, XV. Remember, we had only these famous two vectors. And, and gamma, remember this formula at the beginning of the lecture as uh, G inverse, uh, time, one half G inverse of the derivative of G, I, J. But what is G11 one, one is capital E. What is G12 is capital F. What is G22? Two, two? is F, is G. Okay, ah, so, so the Christoffel symbols are actually some kind of combination times the inverse of the first fundamental form of partial derivatives of these functions E, F, and G. In that language, that's the way you would write it. Take it, put it here, and find the old geodesic equation. So these are exactly those geodesics. Okay, once you study surfaces has Riemannian manifolds, what you are just doing is you are taking the induced Riemannian metric by R3. So this is the new language. Okay. Very good.
So of course, I mean, I, I, I'm being very, very quick now, but of course, rem I'm proving things by just remembering. For example, and what are the geodesics of Rn with the Euclidean metric? You see, if you ask me questions about geodesic, of course, you are first asking implicitly questions about the Christoffel symbol. So what are the Christoffel symbols of the Euclidean metric? Well, the Christoffel symbol, as I said, there is this formula. I don't even want to remember exactly, but it's the inverse of the matrix, of the metric, times a combination of partial derivatives of the component of the metric. But for the Euclidean metric, the Euclidean metric is essentially characterized by the fact that the coefficients are constants. So any partial derivative will be zero. So the Christoffel symbols are zero. So again, what's happening to the geodesic system in the Euclidean case, it's gamma double dot k equal to zero for k equal to one n, which is the, so what is the solution of this? Is each gamma k is a linear function in time, meaning the curve is a straight line, is more than a straight line. It's, it's a straight line parametrized linearly, because even a straight line could be parametrized as a mess. In fact, what is one beautiful property of geodesic? That they come automatically, always, not just, so this was, we checked on our end. On any Riemannian manifold, they come with a natural parametrization. Because being a geodesic is, not, is, is a mixture of two things, is a, is a property of the trajectory and of the parametrization of the trajectory. Because if the, vector, if the tangent vector has to be parallel, in particular, the norm of the tangent vector, how much is it? One, you have been a bit too optimistic. Yes, you are essentially right, but not exactly right. It's constant. It's constant. I cannot really say one. Okay. Then, so that means geodesics are automatically parametrized by uniform motion. So the, the velocity is constant. So then I can decide, some books decide right from the beginning that geodesics have speed one. And some books prefer to leave the speed free and to do some game. Okay, that's uh, part of the, of the freedom that uh, you, you get. Okay, so of course this is a huge, so in fact the natural question is why? I mean, I introduced them as a very natural class of curves with, in terms of this notion of geodesic. This, this is probably the way a physicist would study them. Why? This is a very natural definition given by somebody doing general relativity. If it's parallel, parallel means it doesn't feel, it doesn't, a particle moving on a geodesic is not feeling any force. You see, that's, that's why, I mean, this is, this is a beautiful part of mathematics and physics and whatever, so it's, it's a pity to do it in 30 seconds. In fact, that's exactly the point, I don't know if I've already told you, I mean, there's a beautiful book where, so when Einstein was writing down the general relativity, he needed all this, no, of course. I mean, saying that the universe is essentially a Riemannian. I mean, okay, it's a Lorentzian, but it's essentially the same thing. It's a Riemannian manifold with some properties, satisfying some kind of partial differential equations. He had to understand Riemannian geometry. It's one of the few accidents where actually mathematicians uh, were, came before. Usually it's physicists need something, they develop something, and then mathematicians are running back, <laughs> trying to, to make sense of uh, something, I mean, okay. So this was one, actually one of the few cases in history where mathematicians actually did something and then physicists realized it, how to use it. So they actually, uh, I mean, Riemann was 60 years before Einstein and Levi Civita was just a few years before, but in any case, the machinery of Riemannian geometry was essentially ready. I mean, everybody knew, I mean, Levi Civita had already proved this, Bianchi, I mean, it was not because I'm Italian, it was also a very Italian subject, so kind of French and Italian, Poincaré and you know, Adam Ard on one side, and Bianchi, Levi Civita, Ricci, so these are all the big names that you still find 
in all the definitions, they bring all these names. Everything was ready, but physicists didn't really know. It was very, very hot mathematics. I mean, it was really uh, contemporary mathematics. It was not something that was part of the, of the culture of any physicist. So when, Riemann realized, when Einstein realized that he needed this, he realized that the notion of a particle moving without forces was somehow connected to the notion of parallelism. And he needed to study parallelism. And he did not understand it. It's nice. So he asked his friend, he had a mathematical friend, Grossman, no? who is the greatest mathematician doing these kind of things. It's a professor in Paris, Cartan. OK, so dear Professor Cartan, they didn't have emails, so which was be much better, because they can think of, it, of, the, of the question and they can think of the answer. Now by email, you don't even think, you answer, and then you realize it's stupid. Okay? <laughs> so they had to write, to send things. And uh, so there is this beautiful correspondence between Einstein and Cartan. Cartan trying to explain Einstein what, 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 it, what this really means and how, in which kind of spaces you can talk about parallelism and so on. So it's kind of, he's giving tutorials to Einstein. And at the end, of course, Einstein wrote the theory of general relativity, so presumably he understood it quite well. So anyway, it's in the library. It's, uh, the, now the, all these letters are collected, and uh, there is this correspondence Einstein-Cartan. In any case, that's why what I'm always to say, the tangent vector being parallel, you see, now, you don't have anything around if you are thinking of a universe, no? By definition, there is nothing around you. There is no normal vector. Remember, in the case of a surface in R3, we said, ah, something is a geodesic if the particle moving along the geodesic has acceleration parallel to the normal to the surface. So that's like saying, that was a, nice, a very nice interpretation if you could look at everything from outside. You say, well, this particle is not that it does not have forces on acting on it, but all the forces acting on it are pointing to the normal direction, to the surface where it lives. So basically, the only real force acting on it is essentially the constraint of living on the surface. So for a particle moving, on, if, if something moves by uniform motion on the sphere, of course, there is something acting on it. But it's something that if, if the sphere was my universe and I was the particle moving, I could not detect. Because it's the normal vector. Okay? So this is kind of related to this. This is like saying, if, if, I, if I am the particle and I want to say, what does it mean I have no forces? It's kind of F is equal to MA, no? So I should say, I don't feel any acceleration. Force and acceleration. But what is acceleration? Well, acceleration has to be how the velocity is changing. So it's the derivative of gamma dot and along gamma dot because I'm living on this curve. So it's actually, so the acceleration has to be nabla gamma dot gamma dot. So if I live on a geodesic, I would say that I have no acceleration. So these are in inertial motions. That's why, a that's why a physicist would immediately write down these kind of things. These are the kind of the quiet motions in your space, geodesics. Okay. Why a geometer would tend to say, OK, who cares about acceleration? I, mean, I really want to solve the, pro the other problem, the other big problem. Give two points, which is the curve of shortest length, Actually, it's quite amazing that two things actually become the same, no? So again, you, you could take, if you, I mean, these two lectures are basically for you to be able to take any book. I mean, we want, this is really the beginning of a story. We are doing chapter one, essentially, of any book in Riemannian geometry. So I'm just telling you a warning. There are books which start from the geometric problem. Say, I want to solve the problem of connecting two points with the, possible, the shortest possible length. And then I derive this equation. Then there are books which start this way, say, oh, it's very natural to think of parallel motions because these are the non-accelerating particles. Okay. And then I find the same equation. And then at the end, of course, there is always a chapter three or four where the two things are connected. Okay. 
So this is a matter of taste of what, which one do you prefer. Okay, so out of this, so at least we will save at least one lecture for curvature, uh, we can formalize the following notion. But let me tell you, even if in three minutes, but it's, uh, it's usually very formally very disturbing for students. You can actually build. Remember what we did again for surfaces. We used geodesic to construct a nice coordinate system. Okay? Actually, on a Riemannian manifold, this works even, I mean, not, you, seeing the problem from a more general point of view makes it even more beautiful, the answer. So let me spend the last uh, five minutes on this. <coughs> not something we can do in three minutes, so I think maybe not. It's, it will be just confusing. So okay, that's the point where we will start uh, uh, next lecture, okay? So.